what if I told you that we have a vaccine that can save lives, but we're just not using it? A vaccine that can prevent this and this. These refugees, they wouldn't need to flee. This mother, she wouldn't be crying. And these homes, we wouldn't need to rebuild them. Now, it may sound impossible, but think of all the progress we've made as a human race. We live longer than ever before. In just 30 years, we've reduced poverty by 75%. Just 50 years ago, the majority of the world was illiterate. Now, 90% of people under 25 can read and write. But where on earth don't we see this progress? In places affected by war. I've seen violence start and stop. I've seen violence prevented and lives saved. Over the last 20 years, across dozens of countries, I've seen a vaccine to end war. I got a glimpse of this 30 years ago, when I learned about apartheid in South Africa, the legalization of that ideology which put whites superior to blacks. There was nothing more I wanted to do with my life than to help bring it down. So I became an activist while I was at Stanford University, and a few weeks after graduating, I was on a plane to volunteer at an anti-apartheid newspaper in South Africa. Now, at first, I lived with whites, and during the day with the journalists, I'd go into the township, uh, into the black townships, but back to the white area at night. And it felt wrong. I mean, how could I be complying with the very apartheid rules that I was there to fight? So I decided to live in the township. This was unheard of, and both blacks and whites told me it was a crazy idea, stupid, I would be raped and killed. But the minute I moved, everything changed. When I would wake up and leave my house in the morning, people would leave their homes, they would call their neighbors. I caused major traffic jams, and by the time I actually got onto the train, it was like a town hall meeting with all kinds of people asking who I was and what I was doing there. But soon, they came to know me as their sister, who had come closer on their terms. I learned Zulu. I took the Zulu name Nomfundo, which means one who is learning. And I even built my own shack. It was a human act, but a political statement. And yes, there were risks, but the closer I got, the safer I felt. And during the day, I would be covering the apartheid hit squads and human rights abuses as a journalist, but I often felt that those train rides, that's where change was really happening. We were poking a hole in the present and getting a glimpse of a future that otherwise seemed unimaginable. And those years leading up to the 1994 election of Nelson Mandela, I mean, they were scary. There was a lot of violence, and many people predicted that the country would spiral into a bloodbath. But skilled negotiators like Cyril Ramaphosa and Rolf Mayer, they've made people able to see beyond just winning and losing at the ballot box to a future for all. They built a path of trust, and they said, come, walk with us. This is the path for heroes. So this experience in South Africa this experience in South Africa taught me three things about ending war. Firstly, about courage. Not the courage to fight, but the courage to connect. That's where it all starts. Secondly, to ask why. You know, when I was in South Africa, I met many people who had done horrible things. And when I asked them why, they said, I thought it was the right thing to do, or I was scared, or I thought I had no choice. Having the empathy to ask why and understand, that's the second step. And thirdly, if we want to end war, people will need to change, but they won't when they feel afraid or humiliated. So we need to make it okay for people to change. With these three lessons in mind, I felt called to go to the Great Lakes region of Central Africa. For in that very same month of April 1994, when we were electing Nelson Mandela in South Africa, one million Rwandans were being slaughtered in the genocide. Hundreds of thousands more would, were being killed in Burundi, and a few years later, the deadliest war since World War II would unfold in the neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo. I joined Search for Common Ground, 
the world's largest peace-building organization. And everyone that I worked with and came to know had been affected by this violence. They were orphans, they'd seen their friends killed, they'd had to flee and leave everything, and yet every day they showed up with courage to stand and try and reweave back the fabric of these societies. So I want to tell you about two of them from the Congo, Innocent and Rigobert. Rigobert was a fiery student activist who was leading violent demonstrations against Rwanda's involvement in Congo's war. He walked in long strides, had a stoic gaze, and had this way of speaking in complete sentences as though he'd practiced for our conversation ahead of time. Innocent was Munya Mulenge, the people whose tribe had come from Rwanda. And just like the Japanese Americans during World War II, his very identity made him accused of being a traitor. Now, Innocent was tall and lanky with a grin he couldn't really hide, and he'd grown up herding cows. But when the war came, his younger brother was snatched from their home and never seen again, and Innocent's father was heartbroken and wanted someone to blame. Blaming was easy. People who called for revenge were heroes. What was harder was to talk you could be seen as being a collaborator. So we managed to find a way for Innocent and Rigobert to have a discreet conversation, and what happened there was a breakthrough. They started to shout accusations at each other. They asked why they and all of their group had done those horrible things, and like the skin of an onion, they began to peel back the prejudice and the stereotype that they'd been taught to believe about the other. Underneath, they found passion, Passion to fight, but not as enemies, as allies for peace. So we needed this idea to spread. We rented a bus, and off they went to the most polarized parts of eastern Congo. We soon learned that one of the best trust-building activities was pushing a bus out of the notorious Congolese muddy roads. But when they arrived in the villages, people either wanted to kill Innocent or Rigobert. They saved each other's lives many times and said, no, that's not what we're doing here. Here, we dialogue. This is a place for heroes. Come and join us. And what started there grew into peace agreements, into programs to help refugees return, into community radio stations. People who had been on a pathway to violence changed course. So I've stayed with Search for Common Ground for 19 years because I see this change happen all the time. From Congo to Nigeria, from Tunisia to Yemen, from Pakistan to Indonesia. Not just with civil society activists, but with heads of radio and television stations, army generals, and even elected leaders. In fact, I began to see a pattern. What we were calling peace building wasn't just a set of ad hoc activities, but a science a proven method to make violence no longer an option, a vaccine to end war. Now, when you go to the doctor, you get your temperature taken, you get your blood pressure, so that your doctor can know how healthy you are, right? Well, we peace builders, we do the same thing, but we look at different symptoms. We look at relationships, inclusion, trust, justice, and dignity. And by we, I don't mean a bunch of Westerners parachuting in, no, I mean peace builders from those very communities affected by conflict. We notice things like, how come the media is only in one language? Or, how come that community doesn't access land? Or, gosh, crimes aren't being solved. Why? Because the young people don't trust the police. Or, look at that narrative that's being handed down from generations that demonizes one group, robbing them of their dignity. And once we do that diagnosis, we know what to do have the courage to connect, the empathy to ask why, and make it okay for people to change. And once we start, we also know how to measure that things are changing, because we see trust levels rise. We see collaboration being replicated, and people are tackling problems not as enemies, but as allies. And in that space, violence is no longer an option. In Kenya, the Al-Shabaab insurgency used the coastline of Lamu Island to carry out attacks in Kenya. 
Now, the Kenyan government was very afraid, and they felt they couldn't uh, keep those waters safe. So they banned night fishing, and this destroyed the livelihood of thousands of fishermen, many of whom said, maybe I should join Al-Shabaab. Maybe violence is a good idea. So we organized dialogue and roundtables with the fishermen, the security forces, the government, community organizations, and they came up with an ID for a, a, a biometric ID card that would enable everybody to have visibility about who was on land and who was at sea. The night fishing ban was lifted, trust was restored, and violence was no longer an option. The vaccine worked. In Tunisia, after the Arab Spring brought down their leader, Ben Ali, in, in 2011, we diagnosed a risk. If adversarial street demonstrations were the only way that young people could continue to participate in change, there was a risk of violence. So for years, we strengthened the capacity of those young people. We helped them to, bring, to build local associations that collaborated with local authorities. And last year, we popularized this idea with a reality TV show called I Am The President, where young people ran for president, but, but winning meant collaborating, not advocating violence the vaccine is working. In Indonesia, the government very successfully arrested and convicted hundreds of people that had been involved and participated in violent extremism. But did that mean that they wouldn't again choose violence? So we worked with the prison officers at these maximum security prisons to help them to, er to learn how to manage conflict without violence and engage with these inmates differently so that they could really be re rehabilitated. And when they step out of prison today on parole, they meet community organizations working with local government to welcome them back with connection and compassion. They're not choosing violence. The vaccine is working. And it does work on violent extremism. This is Arno Michaelis, who founded what would become the largest white power skinhead organization in the world. He told me that he changed when the people he claimed to hate courageously reached out to him. He told me they used their weapon of compassion to make me see that my fear was unfounded. Because when that fear went away, so did the hatred which justified the violence. The vaccine worked. So I'm doing this TEDx today because I want this vaccine to spread. But I know that over hundreds of years, people have resisted vaccines. In fact, in 1796, the inventor of the smallpox vaccine used pus from cowpox, from cows, to invent the vaccine. Even though it was scientifically proven, his efforts were mocked. People were afraid. 300 million more people would die before the smallpox vaccine was mainstreamed and the disease was only eradicated 200 years later. So are we going to wait another th for another 300 million people to die before we adopt this vaccine to end war? Are we going to continue with our bullets and band-aids approach to dealing with conflict, spending more and more money every single year training and equipping people to fight wars instead of prevent them while the numbers of refugees skyrocket? It feels like an experiment that we keep repeating, expecting that we're going to get to a different outcome. Two years ago, I became the stepmother of four children. Before coming here, I asked Amina, who's now 12, what do you say when people ask you what I do? You stop people from fighting, she said. But am I? Are we? I mean, what's really stopping us? Is it that we don't have enough money? Well, let's take a look at where we spend our money. The US spent $6.3 trillion so far on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. The US, in the US discretionary budget, seven out of 10 cents are spent on fighting wars. One drone strike costs $1.4 million. And one day in 2017, when 59 drone strikes were launched in Syria, it cost $62 million. That's more than the annual budget of my organization. In fact, the annual budget of the United States Department of Defense could keep alive the kind of work that I've been sharing with you today from my teams and other peace builders around the world 
for 15,000 years. Do we think it's worth it to invest in peace building and preventing wars? Well, the World Bank recently came up with a report that said if we invest in prevention, we can save $70 billion a year because every dollar that we spend on prevention leads to a savings of $16. And some people will tell us that war is natural, but we know that's not true because so many of the people that we send out to fight wars come back broken with suicide rates amongst veterans twice as high as ordinary people. In fact, since 2001, 45,000 veterans and active servicemen and women have taken their own lives, five times more than those who've died on the battlefield. So what, is, what do I want to ask of you today? Try the vaccine in your own life. Find the courage to connect, the empathy to ask why, and make it okay for people to change without humiliation. But I'll warn you, it's not easy. It's scary. It might hurt. And if you change, you'll probably lose something. But think of what you'll gain, because there's nothing more rewarding than turning an enemy into an ally. But if you and I are the only ones who take this vaccine, it's not going to be enough. We need to invest in this and we need to tell our leaders and elected officials that war isn't working. I don't want to have to look at Amina and tell her that we knew how to prevent war and we didn't do it. It'd be like her asking me, wait, there was a vaccine for this disease and you didn't give it to me? I don't ever want to be asked that question. Do you? Thank you.